I'm Meg Malone, the programming librarian at Carpenter Cars Library, and I'm very excited for this Poetry of Place event that we're going to uh, kick off the um, National Poetry Month, which is April. Uh, but enough about me, I'm not the, the main event here. Uh, so let me introduce our two speakers today that are gonna uh, share their time with us. First up, we have Laura badovsky Vishnevsky, who is the author of the collection Sanctuary Vermont from Orison Books, which you may have seen mentioned recently in the New York Times, which is very exciting, New York Times book review. Um, that is going to be out very soon, Tuesday, April 5th. So yay. Uh, Laura is also the author of the chapbook, How to Prepare Bear from Redbird Chapbooks. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming. Plus, oops, sorry. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Narrative, The Missouri Review, Image, Peripheries Journal, Hunger I Mountain Review, well. American uh, Journal of Poetry, Pilgrimage, um, oops, sorry, I lost my space here. The Examined Life and Others. She's the winner of the 2020 Ores in Poetry Prize, Ruminate Magazine's 2020 Janet B. McCabe Poetry Prize, uh, the 2019 Poetry International Prize, and the 2014 Passenger Poetry Prize. So welcome, Laura. Thank you for joining us. And also with us today is Jane Dorney. And Jane is a geographer who helps people connect to the Vermont landscape and understand how it evolved to be the special place it is. Through project-based consulting work, she researches and analyzes Vermont's natural and cultural features, looking for patterns and interconnections. Then in her community presentations, classroom activities, field trips, tours, maps, and her monthly newspaper column called Connect the Dots, that appears in Vermont Community Newspaper Group's Chittenden County Papers. She shares the deeper stories of the Vermont landscape with the larger community. So I'm gonna include some, uh, some links in there for everyone because there's a lot I want you to be able to see from Laura's book to Jane's blog. So I'll be adding those into the chat and I'll draw some attention to those again later. But uh, again, feel free to put questions in the chat that we may be able to get to at the very end. But without uh, further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Jane, who's going to begin our presentation today. Thank you, Meg. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read three of my Connect the Dots columns that have come out in the, over the last year or so. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to include um, some of the photography that goes with them. When the Vermont Community Newspaper Group publishes them, they'll I give them five or six photo options and they'll pick you know, one or two, um, maybe three, uh, but I'm gonna let you see all of them today. Okay, so you can see them all. When the, when the publication rights revert to me, after they've been published in the paper, they, they revert back to me and then I publish, republish them on my website. And on my website, my blog, I put all of the photographs as well. So just so you know where we're going with this. So let me share my screen so you can see these images. Here we go. All right. So connect the dots. So let's see. There we go. All right. First one. It's called Uncommon Oaks on a Global Stage. And what I do when I write these columns is I, I have a question that I pose and then I answer the question. So the question for this one, how do some uncommon Vermont oak trees connect to a global transportation story? And here's the answer. I started in on the trail at the Williams Woods Natural Area in Charlotte to get a first-hand look at some very big and uncommon Vermont trees. As I clumped along numerous truncheons, I could tell that the soils here were wet underfoot. But the clay soils are also very productive, whether growing trees in a natural area or growing corn in the neighboring fields. Soon I crossed a tributary of Thorpe Brook and started to see what I came for. The huge oak trees ahead had enormous presence with trunks up to three feet in diameter 
and large arching canopies. Some of the Williams Woods trees are estimated to be well over 200 years old, dating back to about the time of European settlement. If so, when these big trees were young, they would have witnessed their ancestors playing a key role in a global story. The oaks in the story include white oaks, fir oaks, and swamp white oaks, which are members of the group that botanists call white oaks. All of them have very strong, durable wood that is also water and rot resistant, and they are all commercially interchangeable. The white oaks are at the northern edge of their ranges in a very narrow band hugging Lake Champlain, and they are much more common further south from Massachusetts to Georgia. The lake's moderating effect allows them to be this far north, and their proximity to that same lake played another role in their history. An intermediary in the White Oak story was John Thorpe, whose family name was given to the brook that runs through Williams Woods. He arrived in 1795 and began to cut trees to clear the land for his homestead, which he built just north of what is now Williams Woods. He also established the first general store between Rugens and Burlington shortly after he arrived. He was described as a successful merchant and to stock his store with goods the local people could not produce themselves, he went north to Quebec via the lake. As a result of his connections there and the water connections and world market he had access to, he decided to add another line of business. A British Canadian about this time described the white oak in Vermont's Champlain Valley as beyond comparison, the best oak timber of any in America and stated that Canada had no oak of any value but that the deficiencies may be abundantly supplied by the oak in Vermont. So Thorpe began to ship oak and pine timber north. As many more settlers arrived from southern New England, they started to clear their land for farming too. Those near the lake could also sell the oak trees they cut for lumber, rather than just burning the trees as many inland did. The land just south of the natural area is cornfield now. But the white oaks that had been there were felled, squared with hand tools into long timbers, and dragged or sledded to the nearby lakeshore, probably in the winter over the frozen ground. There they were fastened together to make rafts, and the rafts fitted with sails. They were then sailed north of the lake's outlet down the Richelieu River to the St. Lawrence River, then down the St. Lawrence to Quebec City under British rule, where Thorpe sold them. They were then loaded onto ships that sailed for Britain, where they were fashioned into new ships for the British Navy and merchant fleet. Staves for wooden casts, hogsheads, and barrels used to transport foodstuffs. The oak timber from this area ended up circling the globe, cutting through salty water, keeping people and goods afloat, and rolling down gang planks at docks in foreign lands. The fate of the white oaks <clears throat> that I can see in Williams Woods was shaped by there being some of the northernmost white oaks that happened to be next to a connected set of waterways at a time when trees were being felled and global commerce was expanding. The few white oaks now left along the lake, estimates are 10% of the original, are in small discontinued remnant forests and worthy of preservation. The Williams Woods Oaks probably survived because the soils were too wet for farm fields. In their long lifetimes, these white oak trees witnessed the landscape's enormous change from forest to farms. Now they are providing seed to keep this forest going, hopefully long into the future. As our climate warms, I also see them as a seed bank to help the Vermont landscape adapt as the range of the white oaks expands northward. The white oaks. Next. This one is winterberry in the hedgerow. And the question I asked for this one was what role do hedgerows play in the landscape? And here's how I answered that. Once the leaves were off the trees, I knew it was time to head out to my favorite high meadow to cut a few twigs of winterberry. Its bright red berries add some winter cheer to my kitchen table, and my annual trip is a chance to see what's happening in the hedgerow along the way. I headed up through the woods, crossed the hayfield, and started toward the hedgerow. 
The monochromatic hayfield underfoot contrasted with the hedgerows eclectic variety of young leafless brown and gray trees and shrubs woven together with climbing vines. As I neared the hedgerow, I could see something much older peeking through the gaps in the thick vegetation, a broad stone wall. Our side of the wall was an old pasture. In this group of features, I could read parts of three centuries of shifting land uses that enriched my journey. The tangle of hedgerow plants dominated the foreground as I walked. But the stone wall was the critical feature that anchored the interwoven stories here. Sections of the stone wall were probably 200 years old since this farm had been operating in the early 1800s. Typically 19th century walls were built around the edges of the cultivated fields using the stones heaped across. Farmers moved the stones before their yearly plowing so they didn't harm their plow blades. The three foot tall wall was a barrier to my movements, so it was easy for me to remember their original role. They kept the farm animals out of the cultivated fields. The hedgerow plants are much younger than the wall. A lone tall elm was probably the oldest. In the early farm days, the edge of the field along the wall was kept clean of seedling trees or shrubs by hand cutting or burning. This meant the wall could be repaired as needed and made it easier for farmers to keep an eye on their crops and livestock. But in the 20th century, this elm may have been intentionally left to create some shade for the cows in the pasture. The rest of the trees along the wall were a young mix of species, including birches, poplars, red maples, and a volunteer apple tree. Most of them were pressed in a narrow zone the haying equipment couldn't reach. As the 20th century progressed, the maintenance of walls, maintenance of walls was let go. The trees that spread were mostly wind dispersed species, but the deer prints and chewed fruit I saw near the volunteer apple tree reminded me that some of the trees were spread by mammals. I even had to step over the occasional coyote or fox scat. Shrubs and vines filled in the trees, deserted their very personalities. The brambles had already been picked clean by birds, but many other shrubs brought splashes of color with the vivid tones of late season berries, contrasting with the neutral tones of the leafless branches. Red rose hips, held onto the tips of their twigs. Dark blue wild grape bunches cascaded over other, other plants. And nannyberry twigs sagged with their pendulous heads of indigo berries. A chipmunk with bulging cheeks poked his head up between some stones and I gave it a nod. Realizing his predecessor may have brought the original shrub seeds it was enjoying now. I kept walking along the wall toward the top of the high meadow where the woods began. Here, the winterberry shrubs in their full glory. Winterberries are Vermont's only native deciduous holly. I cut a few berry loaded twigs to take home and turned to enjoy the view below. All the features were laid out together. The hayfield, the hedgerow, the old pasture in the foreground, and the patches of woods below and above. I realized that though the stone wall anchored the scene before me, <clears throat> the role it played had dramatically shifted through time. Instead of being an exclusionary barrier to farm animals, it had become an animal travel corridor, providing food and cover. What I saw before me resonated with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department's recent announcement that it was adding hedgerows to their digital maps used for conservation planning. Research is showing that many animals use hedgerows as corridors to move between large blocks of intact forests. And researchers expect hedgerows to play an increasingly key role in the migration of animals as they adapt to climate change. It gave me a lot to think about as I wended my way home with my winterberry twigs in hand, soon to be placed in a vase on my kitchen table and enjoyed for months to come. That's the winterberry in the hedgerow. Okay, one more. <clears throat> this one, supercontinent Pangea's effects in the Champlain Valley. So the question I was thinking about here was, how does the Champlain Valley connect to the ancient supercontinent Pangea? And here's the answer. 
I climbed to the top of Mont Philo to see the magnificent view of the Champlain Valley from the top of the cliff face. The pastoral farmland in the foreground, the beautiful lake stretching north and south, and the Adirondacks on the horizon. But I also wanted to get an overview of something much, much bigger. From the top of Mont Philo, the evidence of two scenes of an ancient global scale drama can be seen. The formation and breakup of Pangea. The first scene in the drama took, literal, took place literally under my feet. As I stood there, the cliff rocks seemed firmly anchored in place, but hundreds of millions of years ago, they had been in motion. Pushed by the immense forces of colliding crustal plates as the supercontinent Pangaea was forming. As the African and North American plates were moving shoulder to shoulder, the enormous compression folded some of Vermont's bedrock into the Green Mountains and Northwest Africa's bedrock into the Little Atlas Mountains. Further west of the Green Mountains, some of the bedrock fractured and slid as it was pushed upward and westward over stationary rock. The cliff face I was standing on was the sharp leading edge of one of those moving rock faces that had been thrust many miles westward. In fact, it is part of the westernmost fault line in Vermont, created by Pangea's formation that extends the lake, length of Lake Champlain, called the Champlain Thrust Fault by geologists. Here at the park, it is about 500 feet higher than the park entrance, even after millions of years of erosion. The pastoral lowlands I can see below me were the stationary rocks that the cliff rocks had overridden. When I'm standing on this abrupt cliff, I'm on the westernmost line in Vermont where the extensive prolonged movement of supercontinent Pangaea's formation ground to a halt. After Pangaea formed, it stayed together as one supercontinent for many millions of years. During that time, the major geologic forces in the area I was looking at were quite quiet. Then, about 200 million years ago, Pangaea started to pull apart and break up into the separate continents we know today. The next scene in the world scale drama played out in the panorama I was seeing beyond the farmlands, out in the long blue ribbon of Lake Champlain. The, lake's wa the lake water's smooth surface conceals the shape of the land under it, but the lake basin's shape was created by Pangaea coming apart. I could see the Charlotte ferry route to Essex, New York from the park cliff. When crossing on the three mile route from the Vermont side, the lake bottom drops off steadily over the first two thirds of a mile to a hundred feet deep. And in the next eighth of a mile, it suddenly drops to 300 feet deep. And it quickly bottoms out at about 400 feet deep. It's relatively flat mid lake at the 400 foot depth. And it rises fairly steeply again as you, went, as you near the New York shore. Scientists who have studied the lake say that there are about 300 feet of loose sediment below the current up to the bedrock bottom about 700 feet below lake level. When I ferry across the lake, I'm riding over a lake basin that is shaped like a very deep, narrow trough with steep sides. How did this form? When the supercontinent Pangaea started to pull apart, the bedrock started to stretch. In one of the stretching sessions, the bedrock where the lake is now broke on both sides, creating a large block. The large bedrock block fell down relative to the surrounding rock, creating the basin. The basin eventually filled with water and formed Lake Champlain. One way to think of the lake basin is that it was one of the stretch marks of Pangaea breaking up. While I contemplate this, the view from the park cliff, I know that the supercontinent Pangaea was responsible for the major highs and lows of the Vermont landscape before me. Pangaea's forces pushed up the cliff I was standing on as the continental plates squeezed together, now about 500 feet up from the park's front gate, and pulled open the lake's basin as it was coming apart, now more than 400 feet below the shoreline. My magnificent view was shaped by some very large scale drama indeed. So there you go.
Um, I also want to let you know that I have a new column that was just published on Thursday in The Citizen, which is the Heinsberg and Charlotte um, paper of the Vermont Community Newspaper Group. Um, it will, should be in the other two papers, the Shelburne News and the other paper um, in the next week or two. Um, it'll, it'll be out on all three papers over a short period of time here. But it is on the website of the Vermont Community Newspaper Group if you want to see that now. So that's, that's it. Oops. All right. Lovely. Thank you, Meg. Um, I also want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I want to thank Carpenter Course Library. Thank you so much, uh, Meg, for organizing this. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my collection, Sanctuary Vermont, which, as Meg said, has just been released from the really wonderful Orison Books, um, great publisher. The poems are set in an imaginary town in Vermont, and the poems are in the voices of lots of different speakers. And though they're based on research, all the people and places are fictional. And I'm not gonna to say too much in between poems because I, I think we're gonna have a little time to talk afterwards. Um, so uh, in 1816, there was this big volcanic eruption in Indonesia and it emitted so much ash that it actually um, temporarily created climate change, um, which uh, um, really brought the temperature of a lot of places down. And in many parts of the world, it's sometimes referred to as the year without summer. <clears throat> Our Year Without Summer, 1816. Every month there was a frost. Frozen birds fell rigid from the sky. Shorn sheep perished where they stood. The corn crop failed, as did the grain. Even Mrs. Moore, who heretofore had put on airs, bowed her head in thanks for hedgehog stew and nettles. In June, when Prudence Lexter froze while fetching wood, I took her seven children in, poor spindly dears. They died all but the oldest girl when the sickness came. It struck us like a drunkard's blow. Boys took up spades to help George Franklin dig the graves, but the stunned ground would not break. That smooth-skinned pastor up from Boston, blamed it on our sins and our youngsters stealing kisses in the birches down by Black Plum Lake. A God who wields his anger cold, I do not hold to that. I say we are a frail and faltering flock cast out into this wilderness of rocks and wind. The touch of skin to skin is all we've got. I'd rather praise the blood than curse the heart. On my marriage prospects, 1888. In our nowhere town of hills and rocks and wood, there are hardly any black men, not my blood. But a woman's got to marry, so my mama says, off to the city of Virgins to meet that Mr. Balland, aged 41. I told my daddy, no, I will not wed a bag of bones. I do not care if he is blacker than obsidian. My own sister, Lila, stuck with Wagoner degree, that sad face could make the sunshine cry. Or what of Hannah Lawrence and the youngest Obi boy? He's white as milk and snow. You would not catch me with a man whose people thought me low. There is someone. He's a porter at the Sanctuary Inn. His skin is brown and gold like autumn afternoons. In his uniform, he resurrects my soul. My daddy says, he'll surely roll right out of town the way he rolled right in. Good Lord, I say, there's more to life than church and butter. I've read poetry. My daddy says he's seen the world. He says it's cold. Well, it's cold here too, and small as yesterday without love. Our 
at the Tears and Fears Cafe after the Great War, 1919. You want burnt bread with an iron crust, a carp's strafed head on a broken plate, dove's gut, angry meat bled dry, whiskey that cuts across your tongue to the dead part. You want the scald, but they bring you quiet, dark plums. They bring sweet, cool cream. They know why you've come. They know what you've seen. They can read it on your wrists. They'll take you like this, empty. Peonies, 1924. In June, the petals of, uh, let me start again. In June, the petals of Maman's white peonies bloomed against the picket fence, spreading out like mirth unbidden, like a girl's dressed fancy, laughing over nothing. So it seemed the year the clan sprang up like mushrooms after rain, sudden, strange. The night the clan burnt down our picket fence, there was no moon. The shouts woke me. I'd never heard the sound of hate before, but I knew it the way a horse knows fire. The sight, the pointed hoods thrown back like ladies' bonnets on a windy day, their faces torchlit. Among them, my own beau, Augustus Bannister, his mother, his father mad with drink. I'd seen a wild dog's mouth twist like that. The peonies are gone. Mama let the charred ground lay. Papa sleeps with his rifle near. The clan did that, like mold to hay. And my blossom days ended. Sometimes the corn's silk is gold while there's rot in the cob. It's the same with the world, and it's best to know. I found out that the last poor farm in Vermont closed in 1968. Mark on a tree, 1936. My mother's white sleeves flapped like dove's wings in wind. My father lifted me and I flew. In summer, wild raspberries, thick cream, crayfish in the dappled stream. But a wild hail felled the field. As we could not pay our debt, they bid my father out to Franklin Whitcomb's farm. My mother warned away to Jericho, I to the poor farm. Hard girls stole my bread there. All night a woman screamed, Jesus, help me, help me. The yellow apples cling though the leaves have dropped. The naked branches gnarl and bow down. On this tree, I scratch my mark before I'm gone. My name is Ellen White. My mother brushed my hair and let me stroke the hen and hold the smooth eggs. The overseer says I am nothing. But once my mother danced and I danced with her. Margaret Gadro's Mike, 2007. Killed last March, Afghanistan. That boy could fix anything. We heard she walked to the barn in her nightgown, let the chickens out, 
and lit it. So I remember that um, several years ago, the Dalai Lama visited Vermont and spoke at Middlebury College. And I started imagining his drive back to the airport on the back roads. And so came this poem. Dawn, Sanctuary, Vermont. In snow, as light as breath, the Dalai Lama's driver jazzed on oolong tea and lack of sleep, prays in a long exhale as the tires skid then grip. From the Mountain View Hotel, a woman in last night's clothes, nursing the last of the pack, watches the silver rental car almost lose the road. In front of Obi's quick mart, a boy with a glowing shiner, his brother's keys and a cell phone, looks up in time to glimpse the slow slide through the light on bridge and main. Just then, in urgent care, a man with a DNR dreams that his first wife is calling out his name from the heart rate monitor. Every day has at least one marvelous thing. Today, it's the Dalai Lama smiling at a sparrow stitching upward through the glitter of the sun-struck snow. This next poem is called ICE. And of course, we all know that this word also is the acronym for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. ICE. My brother says it's bad. Snow, ice, stay in Mexico. But I come anyway. Gadro's dairy farm. At least the double wide is warm. An old guy going home mumbles, enough is enough, and gives me his boots with rubber stars on the soles for the ice. Ice polishes the path to the barn. Ice grows a skin on the pond. Ice hangs from the roof like wolf teeth, hard and glistening. Fourteen hour days, two milkings. Every Saturday, I drive with the guys to town, and every time my brother says, stupid, don't go, agents could be anywhere, in the grocery, the hardware store. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, but I go. I'm a man, not an animal to be tethered, to be milked. After watching that show, excuse me, <clears throat> after watching that show on DNA and race, I mentioned it to Phil. He closed one eye, a red zone warning sign. In his crushed glass voice, he said, if that was you had that blood, I'd have never married you. It took a beat to head. I spun up inside myself like feathers in a dryer, then floated down, but not into the same old what do I know shoes. I'm ashamed to remember that time in the parking lot of Harding's Hardware. Phil swerved his size matters Chevy right at a black lady and her baby. I just sat there my soul on pause, sin silent, texting my sister. I think I'll end with one more poem about my favorite imaginary cafe. The Tears and Fears Cafe offers curbside pickup. Dear loyal patrons, Remember our sign's neon halo, our ancient tables with their fork-etched names, Ramona's voice 
putting the whole town in its place, and the way our hard days turn to din and song. Dear loyal patrons, remember Andre's grief soup? It's lemon, a narrow stairway to a tiny upstairs window. Max's one-sided noodles, how they swam in a sea of saffron like the past swims in tenuous laughter. How they dyed the tongues, the town's tongues yellow. And Ramona's cake of Sundays, shy as a dove in springtime, restless at the first bite but then fluttering its wings. Eat, drink. Tonight, let the clink of the town's spoons sound in the unsure air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hear something from you. Hey. <laughs> yes, I see also some of the, the uh, clapping emojis are, are coming up here, which is always nice. Thank you. Let me just uh, kind of bring us bring our presenters all back together here. Thank you to both of you. This was so great. And I'm, I'm seeing some a uh, little bit in the chat. It's a lot of me. So please feel free to go back and look. Um, there's some links in there that I think would be uh, excellent for you all to check out. There's the link to Jane's blog um, hosted on her website as well, so you can peruse that. There's also uh, the link to Order Laura's uh, collection, just imminently to be published. It as actually, well. it's actually out. Oh, all available. right. So that's sorry, I gave you older news. Oh. Um, yes, it can. You can order it right this moment. Perfect. <laughs> well, the website is right there for ordering, um, as well as the link to your website on uh, to sign up for poetry newsletter, all of those awesome things to continue the, the conversation as we're going even beyond um, today. And some very wonderful comments there in the chat. So Jade and Laura, I hope you take a second to look through those. Um, we're just going to do a little bit of q and I have a couple questions, but again, if you have some stuff you'd like to to put in the chat, uh, I would love to, to hear from, from more of you. Uh, my one question that I'd like to pose to, to both of you um, is just about, you know, kind of where you find you get your inspiration and then what your writing process looks like. You know, what is kind of your brainstorm to putting words on paper to deciding that you've actually completed a, a thought there? And either of you wanna uh, answer that, that'd be awesome. Okay, um, that's a lot. Um, uh, well, <laughs> I can abbreviate it. Maybe, maybe I'll just talk, you know, it, inspiration for me varies, but I can talk about my inspiration for sanctuary because that was kind of specific. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I was walking around um, Heinsberg, uh, my, this little hometown, and I was thinking, you know, this is all going to be gone soon from development, the small townness of it. So I'm like, I should document that. Um, so I started out just wanting to like, you know, take a sort of poetry photo of it before it disappeared. And as I, and then I started doing some research and I just found myself running into all of these, all of these voices from the past that hadn't really shown up very much in history. And um, I also started to um, really uh, pay attention to some of the um, inequities and deep divisions that ran through this town, his, you know, historically, and I saw that they were the same as, in a lot of ways, as what's going on in the country at large and even the world. So um, as I started to dig deeper, these these characters just kind of basically were like, Ahem, excuse me, can you please write a poem for me? So I just kind of went into dialogue with them. and. Uh, that's what they had to say. I mean, that sounds sort of, that's actually how it kind of, it went. They just sort of showed up and wanted to have their say. Jane, what about your inspiration? Mm, well, I'm, I'm a self-employed consultant. So I do project-based um, projects on the Vermont landscape and how it's evolved through time. Um, and so, 
as I do research, I'm doing oral histories, I'm doing deep dives into historical documents, I'm walking landscapes, um, trying to understand them. And you know, the stories that have been shared with me, uh, just sticking with me all the time. And then as I do presentations and I do the field trips and, and do other things, people will say, um, you know, I'll run into them at the grocery store or, you know, whatever. And they'll say, oh my gosh, you know, when you, I never look at my town the same way anymore after, and they'll tell me something that really stuck with them. And I'm like, no, not everybody can come to a lecture or sign up for the field trip or whatever. And the stories that stick with me and that are sticking with, with other people, um, maybe I should give access to more people for those same stories um, about the Vermont landscape. And, and so I reached out to the Vermont Community Newspaper Group and they were all in. They were all in. They've been wonderful to work with. Um, been wonderful to work with. So. That's how it started. Like I say, 20,000 mailboxes, <laughs> um, writing about the landscape that people are moving through on a daily basis. So. I can answer your other question if you want, Meg, about sure. process. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, I don't have like one way. I do compose right onto the, my computer because that helps me like, Get a little separated from myself which i think it, it is helpful and sometimes it i you know something just kind of pops into i don't know if it's the same for other right i know there are a lot of writers here with us so i don't know if it's the same for you but some once in a while just a first line will come but most of the time um i sit in front of the blank screen which i find the most terrifying thing in the world and so basically i just start writing something to make the blank screen go away and then most of my work is in revision and revision and revision yeah yeah anything i'll i can revise forever i just can't i'm just that big white screen i'm that i have to make that i have to fill it with something fast that's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Um, really, I think you both touched on this a little bit, but when you're, you know, publishing your your work, you know, whether you know it's going in the community newspapers, it's coming out as a book, obviously that now other people are are getting to see it and read it and absorb it. And I'm curious, um, you know, just what that feels like to you to have other people maybe you don't know reading your work, if you've had any interesting conversations, what you hope people take away? I guess sort of that relationship going from maybe the solitary work of writing into it, going out into the, the big world. Jane? Sure, I'll answer that one. Um, I think one of the most amusing things that's happened along those lines. So I get um, through my website, people can contact me and um, which, which has been great. And I, I wrote a story, oh gosh, last, was it last spring or last summer, um, about, it was, it came from an oral history that I had done um, about, from a, a town elder who had been a child growing up on a, one of the hill farms, one of the last hill farms um, in his town. Um, quite an amazing experience um, that I had. And there was a story that he told that really stuck with me about the milk cans. And it's a great way to think about um, what it was, what it would have been like um, to be a dairy farmer in the in 1930s or so when it was all going falling apart on those hill farms. And so, so I wrote the journey of the milk can and explained his story. And um, and <laughs> I ended up getting an email from New Zealand. I'm not making this up. <coughs> from what turned out to be the world's expert on milk cans. He'd written like the book on milk cans. And so we, you know, we you know, exchanged a number of emails um, and we were kind of on the same page with, with how I was thinking about it. And um, it was, it was, uh, it was something. It was really something. I really enjoyed that. But I'm really interested in the, the evolution of the Vermont landscape. And so I think about climate change as well. And so sometimes I get those comments about, you know, what did you learn from the past that we can use thinking forward? So there have been a wide range of, of comments I've gotten. I've really enjoyed. 
Um, so Meg, the question about what does that feel like? It yeah. feels terrific to think that somebody's <laughs> reading my work, you know, I'm because most of the time it's like me and that's it. <laughs> like, um, so, uh, you know, and I've had, you know, the incredible, incredibly validating and exciting feeling of having people say back to me what they got out of the book, for instance, and that feeling of like, yay, because that's what I meant. And being under, you know, being understood and known feels really great. And then, you know, you always hope that maybe whatever you write pushes the world a nudge in a positive direction. That's, you know, it, it, it's nice to at least imagine that, you know, what you've written makes a difference. I think kind of one last question for me, because I'm always always looking ahead. Uh, you know, so we both are doing a lot at the, the present moment. Um, but I'm curious if there are either subjects or projects uh, that you haven't yet worked on that you're hoping to work on, um, sort of what you're, you're looking to do to do next. I, I am working on a, a second collection. Um, but I, I feel too superstitious to sort of talk about it anymore. <laughs> okay, you don't have to. <laughs> but uh, stay tuned uh, sometime in the next however many months or years. Um, yeah, so um, yes, that's really for me. I just, it's actually easier for me to sort of conceive of a whole big project and then let the stuff I write come out of that than to start with individual things and put it together. So. Um, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm sort of definitely waist deep in that right now. Um, yes, yeah, so I think like most writers are always thinking about it, thinking about that. Um, I am just at the very, very beginning stages of, um, trying to figure out whether I could make a collection of these columns published in a book form. Um, and I'm also thinking about a different kind of project. This, um, writing this column is an 800 word limit, um, which is very challenging for me because I don't really like to connect all the different pieces. Um, so I have to pick, you know, I have to pick some smaller part of that. Um, I'm thinking about also an audience of the whole state of Vermont um, and not just um, the things that are pertinent to Chittenden County. So I am, I have an outline. Uh, we'll see um, for another project that would be um, talking about uh, how the rural landscape developed through time in Vermont and the village landscapes evolved through time and how they're connected and and uh, how to read those landscapes as you're moving through the state. So we'll see. We'll see. Stay tuned. Awesome. I'm very excited uh, for for both of you. I'm just double checking. I think uh, we touched on, there was a couple of questions, but I think in your various uh, questions, you answered it, you know, about voice and the, the history. Um, one, one last thing, you know, it's National Poetry Month. I think you both did an, an excellent job of, you know, talking about making poetry of place come alive, you know, through imagery, through words. And I'm curious if there's any uh, other poetry poets you might want to shout out for other people to uh to check out this month or all the that. time really <laughs> go laura <laughs> oh laura i think you're muted <laughs> um yeah you're just gonna have to stop me because i'll just can list um i actually wrote that down in case you asked because otherwise um i think i go to roomy like, if I feel like I've lost my way, I always go back to, to Rumi's poetry. Um, and then kind of Mary Oliver, Oliver, who in some ways is his disciple. Um, I love Ilya Kaminsky, um, Jane Kenyon, Jericho Brown, um, Naomi Shihab Nye are just, um, I'll stop there. I mean, really. And, I, you know, I'm not, I, I tend to love almost everything I read, but I particular I go back to those 
poets. Um, I so admire them and, uh, you know, aspire to like, you know, be able to do some of the things that they do with their, their work. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. And uh, Laura, do you have any other upcoming readings? Um, I, do you want to share that? I do actually. Yeah. Um, and I first want to say that um, the schedule then with that, there's not that many, but they'll be listed on my website. Um, so, and um, if you get the poetry newsletter, um, uh, and if you don't, uh, feel free to subscribe. Uh, um, so it'll be on my website and it was in the, this last newsletter. I am, I'll be reading, um, uh, with a group next Saturday, and I think I saw maybe Julie's here, she's going to be reading with me, where um, the uh, Vermont poets are a part of a lovely anthology called The Path to Kindness, um, edited by James Cruz, so that um, is hosted by Vermont Bookshop next Saturday, and then I'm very excited, May 7th, I'll be reading with two other Orison Books poets whose books have also just come out, um, uh, May 7th um, in the evening. Uh, and then another really exciting reading is May 17th. Um, I will be hosted by the Lawrence Memorial Library um, and actually a whole number of Addison County uh, libraries and um, that I will be uh, actually uh, doing a solo presentation. So um, you might have to buckle your seatbelt for that one. So that's what I've got. Um, uh, and then I will be reading one poem that uh, was placed in a competition by the Lawrence, Dur this is just amusing to me more than the Lawrence Durrell Society. And um, every year, every two years, the, uh, there's a big conference in Toulouse, France that I was invited to, but unfortunately that's not gonna work. So I'll be reading online hosted by Toulouse, a Toulouse France Society in June, um, retrieve my one poem. So that's my, uh, that's what I've got so far coming up. And again, if you go to my website, um, you can find the schedule there. I didn't expect you to remember that. And it should be um, in the chat there, uh, Laura's website, the link to the poetry Thanks. newsletter, as well as the link to Jane's blog. So you can catch up on those many fascinating stories that Jane has put together. Um, and again, the link to order Laura's book, which is out. I'm out, sorry right. for being like <laughs> on the the delay, I was looking at the, the wrong date there, but I, that's very exciting. Um, we should have a copy coming to the library soon for people that are interested in reading it uh, there. Uh, for National Poetry Month, we have a lot of um, books out on display. Uh, also, we have something set up in our catalog so that you can uh, get your, your poetry fixed. So, you know, don't need to limit it to, to April, of course. But um, again, I wanna say, Thank you so much uh, to our two presenters. Again, for those who maybe missed the introductions at the beginning, Laura badovsky Vishnevsky is the author of the Now Out Collection, Sanctuary Vermont from Orison Books, and has been featured in, in numerous publications and received prizes for her work. And Jane Dorney is a geographer who helps people connect to the Vermont landscape and understand how it evolved to be the special place that it is. And you can find her work in the uh, Vermont Community Newspaper Group's Chittenden County Papers, as well as on her blog. So thank you so much uh, to both of you, for everyone who took some time on this Sunday to, to appear with us. I think it was a nice, it's kind of a gray day out there. So this is a fun, uh, brightening activity to be a part of. So thank you uh, so much. Uh, and this, I saw this question come up. This is being recorded. The plan is that um, it will be available for people to watch after the fact. It usually just takes me a couple days to make sure all the formatting and captions and all that stuff is good to go. But um, I should have everyone's emails. So I'll plan to do a follow-up about that as well as to include those links um, that we've been able to share today so that you have those at the ready. So thank you, Laura and Jane. Thank you so much, Meg. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.